Hi and welcome everybody to episode 59 of the Talk is Cheap show. We've got a special show lined up for you today, including a very special guest of mine. But before we go any further, it is my pleasure and honour to introduce my regular analyst, co-host, special friend, Mr. Curtis Shaw in the house. What are you saying, sir? No, I'm good, bro. I appreciate that intro every time, you know. It always gets me gassed up still, but... Um... <laughs> Not much has changed with the Arsenal, has it? But no, I appreciate the intro, bro. No Big worries. Bro. As well, man. It's all good. It's all good. And as I alluded to earlier, we've got a special guest in the house today. Um, he goes by the name of Turkish. Big friend of mine. Lifelong Arsenal fan. Big YouTube influencer. Been on AFTV several times, although it's his first time on the Talk is Cheap show. Very special Mention and digital applause goes out to <laughs> the house. What are you doing, bro? Come on, come on, Laurie. Love for that. Love for that. What are, the intros are mad. I need, I need to get my intros <laughs> up to your scratch, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, you're very worthy of that. Plus, more, you know what I mean, and it's a great pleasure to have you on the show today. It really is, man. I've been trying to get come you on. on. Wow. Love, so, man. Love. Yeah, Appreciate love having me on. Yeah. Okay, man. I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got to say later, but. um. First things first, we do our little rudimentaries on the show. And um, what we always do is start off with the news and notes, which is basically a little recap on things that have happened concerning Arsenal or the football world in general since yeah. the last show. So um, there's not been too much going on, although there has been some transfer activity. Um, so I'll just round that up and we can have a quick look at that. So um, in terms of what's been going on Arsenal-wise, Balogun set to join RB Leipzig. Uh, let's go first with Curtis. What are you saying, bro? What's your thoughts on that one? I mean, I think they've since kind of played it down a little bit, but, you know, it's a situation we're all kind of watching unfold. And, you know, I heard um, Mikel Arteta talk about Balogun and he was saying, you know, the agent seems to want one thing and Balogun wants another. Well, Ultimately, the agent works for the player. So if Balogun really wants to stay at Arsenal, the agent can't really tell him what to do. So as much as I I see Balogun as a young talent, you know, from what I've seen of him, he looks like he's maybe got a higher ceiling than Eddie and Ketia. But I'm never going to get too carried away with a young player that we haven't really seen that much in first team action. So, you know, I hope he stays. If he does want to stay, then, then sign the contract. If he don't want to stay, then... You're going to move on. I'm more disappointed with the situation that he's got six months left and he can potentially just walk out the door. I think it goes to a tribunal. I think if he leaves, we'd get a little bit of compensation. But again, you know, it's typical Arsenal and it mishandling contract and um, situation. So, yeah, I'm not surprised by it. Turkish, any thoughts on that? Balogun possibly to uh, RB Leipzig? Yeah, I think like exactly the same as Curtis, really. I haven't seen enough of him to know whether he is the next best thing since sliced bread, like a lot of people, you know, want to make out. It seems like, you know, a lot of people want to make out to, to put more pressure on on the people that they want to put pressure on. But the reality is at Arsenal, we've had a lot of strikers over the last 10, 15 years where the hype's been created around them. Chuba Akpom, Benneke Fobe, um, a couple others in there as well, to be honest. I can't think off the top of my head, but there's a few others that... We thought they were going to be part of the, 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 the team in the next few years. And in the next few years, we find out that they're not good enough and they move on to, to, um, to nowhere. So yeah. let's mm. kind of take a back seat here, see how it pans out. We won't know for another two years whether this decision is going to haunt us or not. Yeah. Um, but like Curtis said, it does show mismanagement again. It does show the same problems, which is the biggest thing to take from it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, Mustafi, not leaving, says Arteta. You have to laugh. Are we going to cry, bro? What are we going to do? <laughs> I think we're all pretty much in agreement with that. I think the laughs yeah. that we um, expressed there pretty much says it all about that one, man. Um, yeah. Socrates. Uh, Turkish might have an interest in this one. Um, it's been talked there about him going to Fenerbahce. Yeah, there has been. I, I don't know what's going on. Like, if you ask me about all of this rumours around Fenerbahce in December, the Turkish league is, is currently, you know, going through some financial issues and, and Fenerbahce are going through financial issues of their own. So 
to, to pull off the Ozil deal will be amazing for them. But I don't know how they're going to pull off Socrates and Ozil. But one thing about Socrates that I'll give him credit for is he wants to go and play football. Whereas the, the, the name you just mentioned... The old word. <laughs> yeah, 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 the name you just mentioned. He, do, he, does, he doesn't want to move anywhere. So... Yeah. I was going to ask you about him. Actually, we might as well just roll that into one. Um, <laughs> you know what Curtis thinks about the um, yeah. Socrates and Mustafi anyway. I think that's well well documented, well chronicled on this show. So let's go straight into it. Ozil then. Um, we'll go with Curtis first. Um, so we spoke last week and um, we said that he might leave it until the summer to go. But the more and more I'm hearing about this, it looks like it could happen in January or before the end of January. Uh, so what's your thoughts, Curtis? Just very quickly, because we want to get Turkish in on Listen, Ozil's only leaving if someone writes a big, big check. That's the only way he's leaving, bruv, you know? If the rest of that contract gets paid up, then yeah, maybe I'll leave. Listen, I'm not convinced Ozil's going to leave this month. Seriously, I'm not. Yeah, I'm, I'm not on that. it out, man. Because um, clearly he wants the rest of that wage. So... Listen, I, I hope we can end it because I think it's uh, a bit of a toxic situation now. Um, but I'm not convinced they'll go this month. Right, Turkish. Um, for those of you who don't know, you um, you got the moniker Turkish, so that indicates that you're mm -hmm. Turkish extraction. And previously, you've had quite a bit to say on Ozil. Um, so I'm very keen to learn what you think about the situation now uh, with regards to this proposed move to Fenerbahce. Do you think you'll go to Fenerbahce and do you think it will happen sooner rather than later? Or will he wait until the summer? You know what? What, what I know for sure, yeah, is that Ozil can go this window if he wants to. That is a fact. If Ozil wants to go this window, he can. But like Curtis said, will he be willing to take the implications of, you know, maybe his contract being cut with no, you know, um, no further money coming in? But that's a decision that Ozil needs to make. It's turned into a tit for tat with the club and, and Ozil. And I think that in the summer, we told him that, listen, he's not part of the plans. We want to move him on. He dug his heels in. He stayed. He got his bonus. And then, you know, he got left out of the Premier League squad. And now we're in January. It seems like it's that, that game is still being played where the club don't want to pay him off because the club will probably feel like you've taken the piss out of us for how long and now we're going to pay you off. That, that would make me feel and the club feel that Ozil's won. Whereas if Ozil cuts his contract now and says, you know what, I, I just want to go, the club will feel like they've won and Ozil will feel like he's lost. So it's it's just two egos, the club's ego and Ozil's ego right now. And one of them, one of them just has to, you know, take a step back and do what's best for the club. Mm. Because I thought leaving him out of the squad would stop the questions, but... Obviously, it didn't. Arteta was still asked mm -hmm. about it more often than not. So it's evident that he has to go, you know. Mm -hmm. He has to go now. But it's on him, first and foremost. Now, I'm not saying it's on him, the situation he's in. What I'm saying is if he wants to go, if he wants to play football, he can. Mm. Really is the question. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. I just want to ask you, because um, obviously you're closer to the culture than myself and Curtis. Yeah. Do the in what kind of regard, in what kind of esteem is uh, Mesut Ozil held with the majority of the Turkish football public or in Turkish public in general? It's it's very much split. Um, I think early on in his career, it was probably 80-20 in terms of more more viewed negatively. When he would go play in Turkey, he'd be booed a lot. He wouldn't get you know a, a great reception, and that goes down to picking Germany instead of picking Turkey. And and I can understand that. Um, but as the years went on, he opened up his Turkish side a bit more, especially right. after the issues with the German FA, you know, he, he's kind of lent on his Turkish side a, a bit more and, and, and brought that out. He had Erdogan, the, the Turkish president, as his best man. That's divided opinion in itself because Erdogan divides opinion himself. Um, so he's slowly but surely built up his rep again in Turkey, I'd say. It's about 50-50 now out there. Um, mm. And Fenerbahce are, 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 are one of the, if not the biggest club out there. So, you know, um, he's got a chance to, he's got a chance to rewrite some of the wrongs he's had over the last few years and, you know, maybe finish off his career in, in a positive light. Mm. Um, and I think the Turkish fans and Fenerbahce fans, obviously growing up, 
um, my introduction to football, I had a lot of uncles and, and I, I was a little one running around seeing my uncles wearing blue and yellow. <laughs> Big Fenerbahce fans, you know. So um, I've got a close bond with the club too. So from their side of things, they're very excited, very happy to have someone like that coming in is massive for the club, the brand, everything. Oh, interesting. Uh, the Turkish fans are very much split. And I think, you know, in, in the games, you'll see that in terms of his reception. Okay. That's very interesting. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, good insight into what's going on over there. Um, so just rounding off the news and notes for this week then, um, we've been told that Richard Garlic, I think his name is, uh, <laughs> the Premier League's uh, director of football, is about to be appointed as Arsenal's director of football. Now, I've got to put my cards on the table. I don't know too much about this guy. Um, maybe you guys might be able to inform us more. Curtis, what do you know about him and will this be a good appointment? I mean, at least the, the club are trying to make a move in that direction. Obviously, Hus Farmy left the club. You know, they need somebody to come in and take the weight off Edu and Mikel Arteta and help with transfers and contracts. I heard he had a little bit of a tough time when he was at West Brom. Um, I, I don't think he's got a great record there, but obviously then went to work for the Premier League and I think he's been brought in to try and be a middleman to kind of help relationships with the FA and the Premier League and UEFA and things like that. So, I, listen, I don't know too much about him, but let's hope he can come in and, and help. You know, that's all I can say, really. Yeah. Turkish, any views you want to put forth on that? I, I've done a bit of research on him because you know me. I like to, I like to know who's who's in charge of the bigger decisions. No, very, uh, very a bigger picture. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, he, it's all he has is the West Brom um, reign that we can look on, and he joined them when they was promoted, and he left them when they was relegated. And I think that's pretty much, <laughs> you know, like that's facts. He literally joined them in 2010 when they got promoted, and he literally left them in 2018 when they got relegated. Literally, there was months between it, so it doesn't bode well. I can't lie, but at the same time, yeah. Curtis is right. We need people in there that are experts and look yeah. at the weight structure and how it's held us back. We need someone to sort it out. So I think it's fair to say, by well, what you've just said, there, it's not uh, the most illuminating of CVs. <laughs> it's definitely not, bro. It's definitely not. <laughs> okay, thanks to you guys for that. Uh, so moving on then to uh, one of our regular features of the show, which is to look at the last games since our last show. Now, since our last show last week, there's been two games Arsenal featured in. The first one was the um, third round of the FA Cup. Of course, Arsenal the holders, uh, defenders of the competition. We were at home to Newcastle. I think it's fair to say it was a fairly lacklustre game. Um, we won it in extra time with two goals, uh, one by a very good goal by Emil Smith-Rowe, one of the emerging stars at Arsenal. And, and then secondly by Aubameyang. He finished off a um, the sort of tapping, really. Um, it was good to see him get on the score sheet. Good to see Emil Smith-Rowe score. And of course, good to get the win. But apart from that, there wasn't a whole lot of positives coming out of that game, other than the fact that we got the win and we're through to the next round where we will play either Southampton or Shrewsbury. So let's start with Curtis. Curtis, what was your thoughts on the game? Just very quickly, because we've got quite a bit to get through. I mean, um, yeah, it was it was just another one of them performances, one. It's not one that you're going to pull out at the end of the season and watch the highlights of it. But, um, I mean, what can I say? When... when what I don't like at the moment with us is the reliance on the young players. You know, I think when young players are kind of leading your team like that, it says a lot about the squad and, and the mismanagement of the signings. And, you know, people were, we tried to rest a couple of them youngsters for that game and think, you know what, give them a day off. And in the end, we had to kind of draw for them to get us the victory, like get Smith Rowe on, get Saka on. And that's worrying for me. That's worrying, you know. That tells me you can't even give a player a rest and, and get through the game. Um, you know, Newcastle turned up with very little plan. It was just kind of get the ball to Andy Carroll and let's see what he can produce. And let's be honest, Andy Carroll should have won them the game. You know, we should have been knocked out. He missed He missed two sitters. Leno made a great save. And listen, we got through, though. That's, that's the only thing. It's a cup competition. We got through. And you know we're in the hat, and um, but yeah, that the warning signs were kind of there in that performance. That's that's it, really. Turkish, you want to cook on that? Got yeah, I mean it's, it's the performance we, we should be used to right now. Uh, that's the most common performance we've seen this season. You know, 
So mm. I'm used to it. It's, it's what I expect. And I think it, there's no difference between the Newcastle performance and, and the last game or the West Ham and Sheffield United games at the beginning of the season or the Brighton game a few weeks ago. You know, it's all tight, fine margins. And Curtis is right. We shouldn't have to rely on youth, but we've also seen what the experience have done for us. So as much as we shouldn't have to rely on them, you know, the reality is the experience, they're, they're not experienced enough. So I think it's fair to say then that, um, that both of you were, uh, you know, less than impressed with the performance, although we are grateful for the win and the fact that we're through to the next round, which, as I alluded to earlier, we'll either play Southampton or Shrewsbury in the next round. I would imagine it's going to be Southampton. And that's going to be a pretty difficult game. OK, so moving on again then. So um, that game, got that out of the way. Got a win there, like we said. Uh, followed by a Premier League game at home to Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace in previous years have been a bit of a difficult opponent for us. They've always uh, tended to turn up, play quite well against us. Um, we were, what, four wins in four in Premier League? Um, so we we're coming into this one with a... With a bit of optimism, a bit of form. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> the game didn't materialise the way we would have liked it to have gone. Um, it was a pretty, again, lacklustre performance. Few highlights to speak of. Nil-nil draw. Um, and I think it's fair to say, man, that Palace probably had the better chances and could have won the game. Even though we had, you know, we're going to go strictly by stats. We had more shots on goal and more shots on target. But uh, I think it's fair to say it was a pretty uninspiring stuff. Um, but we didn't lose. I guess that's the only thing we can from it. Um, Curtis, my man, what did you make of the Palace performance? Do you know what? It was, it didn't surprise me to be honest, because you know that everyone keeps talking about this low block. That this is the new phrase now low block, low block. Any team that seems to come and put that kind of barrier up in defense. We seem to struggle to answer the question. And, and again, that's, you know, this is where I ask questions of the manager and, and the system. You've got to have more than one way to open up a team. People keep saying, you know, we need this creative player. We need to go and sign Buendia, this, that, the other. One player, I don't think, changes everything in our team like that. It's not no disrespect to Buendia, but we don't know how good he's going to be. He's not an international. He's in the championship. It's not like when United signed Bruno Fernandes. He was a top, top level player already. So, you know, I just, it was a bit of a toothless performance and um, there's more questions than answers. Let's just put it that way. You know, again, I'm looking at Aubameyang. It was a strange performance from him. You know, he's kind of playing like a winger. You know, I see him putting in crosses with his left foot. He looks short of confidence. He looks a little bit disillusioned, if I'm being honest. Um, you know, I suppose the positive is we kept them, you know, quiet. We kept a clean sheet against Eze and Zaha, which I thought they were going to cause problems. We did fairly well against them. But, you know, it's just it's just a typical Arsenal performance of this season. I see a team that if you make it difficult for them, they don't really have the answers. And I think you have to understand this is a Palace team that had Chep Kiyate playing centre-back, who is a centre midfielder. They had Joel Ward at right-back, who is originally a centre-back. You know, you saw when Aubameyang knocked the ball past him that time and sprinted away from him. I, I didn't think Aubameyang still had that pace. But the first thing I would do as a player, if I knock the ball past the defender and I outrun him like that, I'm doing that seven, eight times in the game. I'm going to keep running him. Aubameyang's getting the ball and passing it back to Ainsley Maitland-Niles. And I'm like, bro, we ain't give you 370 grand a week to pass it back to the fullback. Go and run at the man, try and score a goal. So, listen, it was... And you got to remember, this Crystal Palace team conceded seven against Liverpool. So, you know, if you move the ball well enough, you can open that defence up. So, listen, I think um, it was two points dropped. I think in the end, we were probably quite lucky to get a point. So... Yeah, I, I wasn't happy with the performance and it uh, kind of summed up the season. Yeah, I think that's a fairly accurate summarisation of the game. <clears throat> I mean, um, the things that glared out to me was um, the lack of creativity, the slow build-up in the play, uh, and we were predictable. And it made Crystal Palace's job of defending pretty much very easy for them, really. Didn't it? We didn't really test them. I can't remember the Palace keeper making a meaningful save, especially in the second half. No. Um, so, yeah, it was very lacklustre, very disappointing. Turkish, what was your thoughts on that, bro? 
Same, same. Um, that, that, that's two nil nils in a row when you really think about yeah, it. Yeah, you know, it's two nil nils at home in a row. And on the positive side, you can say, all right, the organization and defense and the structure is back and, and it looks a bit more solid again. You know, it looks like we can, you know, rely on them a bit more over the last few games. But we've seen before how quick that can change. Um, I can't really criticize Arteta for yesterday or for what's happening because. We're two weeks into the window and he told us Edu's got the plan. And here we are, you know, with nothing so far. And you know, we need something. And, and I know what Curtis is saying because one player doesn't fix it all. But but you have to start with one player, you know. Yeah. And, and Buendia or, or someone alike, you know, they might not be the finished article. They might not be the man that Bruno Fernandes in terms of what he's done. But it might take the attention away from other players and... and at Arsenal right now, it's so easy to set up against us because our threats are so minimal that you mark Eddie, I mean, not Eddie, you mark um, Emil, you mark Saka and you nullify Tierney, you pretty much, you know, have done the job because centrally we're so poor that we've got big problems. Um, so I think that we need to do something. Um, but Palace came, set up shop well. They should have won the game. You know, Laurie, you said that, you know, Guaita didn't make us. I, I didn't even think he made a save in the first half either. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't remember a save he made. Um, and I think the most significant save in that game was definitely made by Lena from Benteke. Again? Uh, yeah. yeah. Again. But what I want to do is I, I wanted to, uh, and I'm going to conflate this and it's going to become our main discussion um, to talk about how we move on from here. So, Right about now, we're 11th in the table. We've acquired 24 points. We've played 18 games, won seven, drawn three, lost eight. So we've actually lost more than we've won so far. But we're actually round about the halfway mark in the season. Um, we played 18 games. So if we'd have played the 19th, which we will do soon, we'll be exactly halfway in the season. So what I wanted to ask you guys is, um, given that, that we're halfway through the season and where we are in the league, Realistically, what do you see as our targets going forward to the end of the season? Um, and I want to start with, um, let's start with Turkish on this one. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're 11th in the table and um, we're some way off the top four, although, you know, it has been pointed out to me that we're six points off the top four places. Um, but looking at the squad, looking at where we are, um, throwing the manager as well, Realistically, how do you see this, the rest of the season panning out? And what do you see realistically as our target for this season? Uh, as, a, as a fan, the target is don't embarrass us any further than you have done already. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that's the bare minimum I can ask for. Um, <laughs> so what, what, what would you say is, is acceptable then in terms of a league position? What, anything, below, anything below what's acceptable is technically embarrassing. So what do you, I mean, we finished eighth last year. So what's your minimum requirement then for this season? I don't have I don't have one. The league is a write-off for me. We haven't finished in the acceptable position for three years, let alone me trying to trying to you know think of a positive now and say, well, if we finish seventh, considering we was fifteenth, you know, that's good. When in reality, that's me, you know, plucking at straws, trying to think well, about a positive. Before before the Palace game, there was talk. You know, I've heard it on AFTV and I've seen it on Twitter and stuff like that. Some people say, listen, we're only a few points off the top four. If we could put a run together, I mean, look what Man United have done. They put a run to <laughs> and see you're feeling it. They put a run together and now they're top of the league. Um, can you see Arsenal doing a similar thing in terms of putting a run together and climbing the table and maybe even getting into the top four or the top six um, European places? What do you think? Is that yeah, yeah, the, the 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 only hope we had moving into the season was the inconsistencies of other clubs. That was where I got my hope from because we didn't have a good transfer window. So I looked at other clubs and I said, well, they didn't necessarily have a good one either. Let's see how they go. And then we might be able to nick something from the season. The same can be said now. We're not too far off points wise, but there is a lot of teams between us and those positions. So at the moment, I can't even think about the Premier League. I only think about the next two games and I think... One, two, one, two, one, two, and then see where I am. In terms of long term, 
the club, if I'm looking at it from a club perspective, then the Europa League has to be a priority because four years after dropping out of top four, I always said to myself, Laurie Curtis, you see that first year we dropped out of top four. How long would you say, if you're in a position at the club and you've just seen shit, we've dropped out of top four, how long do you think it's fair to give that person or give that ownership to flip that around? Because I think three, four years is fair. And this is three, four years. So in reality, from their perspective, I expect them to be going for Europa League and Champions League football. From my perspective, I know we're far off that, you know. So I can't expect anything from this season. I can say that I think we'll finish between 6th and 10th. I can say that I think we'll have a decent run in the Europa League. But am I happy with that? No, so just don't embarrass us is, is is the is the minimum I can ask for because they've embarrassed us so many times in the past. Just stop embarrassing us for once and then maybe we can build off of that. Mm. Okay. Uh, Curtis, thanks for that, uh, Turkish. Um, some very forthright views there, some very honest opinions. Um, Curtis, I know you, <laughs> you've got some very strong opinions on this yourself. So start cooking, my man. What do you think? I mean, I mean, as Turkey said there, like I, I wouldn't even want to make a target for the Premier League because none of it is acceptable. So I'm not going to find positives in failure. Um, I think when you look at the Europa League, I, I kind of feel like I look at last season, I thought it was a massive missed opportunity because I don't think the Europa League was that strong last year. When you think about, you know, I think Wolves got to the quarterfinal or semi-final last year, you know, Inter Milan, in the final, Man United were in the semis. I think we could have, you know, challenged for that last year. Um, and you talk about, obviously, when we got knocked out of the top four. I honestly didn't think we'd be out of the Champions League for more than two or three years. We're now in, what, the third or fourth year? And, and you would look at this moment and say, we'll be lucky if we're even in the Europa League next year, you know, because, you know, we, we might not finish there in a league position and whether we can win the FA Cup, I don't know. I just think, you know, the club is going through the motions right now. And, you know, I've spoke to Turkish many times about the overall picture and the ownership, but I just don't see a club that is trying to do anything. I don't see a club that is trying to fix the problems. You know, we, I wanted us to turn up in this January window, two or three players out the door. You know, it seems to me like they're negotiating with Meza Ozil and players like that now. Why have they not done this in the previous months. You know the numbers of the contract. You know what he probably wants to leave. Have it ready where first week of January, two or three players are out the door and you can go and get a signing. We've literally loaned out one player, Kalasinac, and that's it. No one else has left. No one's coming. We'll probably get a panic buy at the end of the window. The planning, the management of the football club from top to bottom it's borderline neglect at times, seriously. And, and I, look, I, I've had a lot of criticism for the manager, Mikel Arteta, and he probably gets a lot of the blame that should go towards the ownership as well. It's just for me that I feel like on the pitch, we should be better than where we are at the moment. I'm not saying we should be in the top four because we probably don't have a good enough team at the moment, but I still feel like Arteta should have got more out of this group this season. When you look at some of those teams that are above us, you know, West Ham, Southampton, Aston Villa. You know, Aston Villa were in a relegation battle this um, this time last season. They've got three games in hand on us and they're two points clear of us. So it's it's kind of, the blame can be relayed at a lot of people, you know, the owner, the players and the manager. And, um, you know, I, I don't see it getting much better for the time being, to be honest, because, you know, I, I don't think much is going to change. So it could be a long, long, hard season for us. I think it's going to be a, a long, hard season. I mean, um, I was looking forward at some of the fixtures coming up between January and February, and I'll just read some of them off to you. So um, we've got the Newcastle game coming up um, very shortly. And after that, we've got Southampton in the FA Cup. We've also got them in the league. Um, we've got Man United at home. We've got Wolves away. Uh, we've got Aston Villa away, Leeds at home. Uh, by that time in February, you've got the Europa League coming round. We've got Benfica, and that's going to be a difficult game. Uh, followed by Man City at home, Benfica at home, and then Leicester away. That, that's to round off February. So, as you can see, guys, there's some pretty difficult fixtures coming up in the next month or two. 
Um, that was why it was imperative, really, that we beat Palace and that we go on to beat Newcastle at home uh, next week because the, the games are coming thick and fast and there's some pretty difficult games in there, man. So given that run of fixtures, Turkish, how <laughs> successful or otherwise do you think we can do in those? I was going. Yeah, see, that point is coming now, and it, and it, and you know what? The, it might fall in line with the transfer window closing because it seems like what we got before the end of the transfer window, we've got Newcastle, Southampton, and United, right? Yeah. And then the transfer window closes. I feel like they probably I won't. Do... Man United walks. Yeah. Oh, before the window closes, yeah. 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 yeah well, it, it, the, the teams are getting better in terms of who we're facing. Obviously, we beat Chelsea, but following Chelsea, Brighton, West Brom, Newcastle, Palace. But like you said, Southampton, United, Man City, Wolves, Leicester, Aston Villa, all around the corner. I think we might as well brace ourselves for what we saw between November and December because it's going to be similar. We might win a few of them because it is all fine margins. When we mm -hmm. lost against Burnley, it was fine margins. You know, There was games in that two months where we shouldn't have lost, but we lost because maybe luck wasn't on our side. Yeah. You know, And I think the same is going to happen now. Because when you play better teams, you know, if Xhaka gives the ball away as many times as he did yesterday against the Wolves, against the Leicester, against the City, then we're fucked. But, <laughs> you know, who knows? Yeah, man. I mean, I mean, listen, runs can be put together. I mean, it was only uh, a month or so ago, people were saying that all this Gunnar Solskjaer might be out of a job at the rate he was going. And then they hit a rich vein of form. And um, they stand, as we record this show now, top of the Premier League uh, with a massive game at the weekend against Liverpool coming up. Um, so, you know, is it out of the way of thinking that Arsenal might be able to put together a similar one? OK, we had those three wins in quick succession, the Chelsea, Brighton and West Brom games, and people were waxing lyrical and saying, yeah, we might see a return to form. Um, so, Kurt, is it feasible that we can given those run of fixtures that I read out, that we can pick up some points from there and start moving forward up the table? I mean, at the time of recording, you know, we've we've been in the middle of that run of fixtures where you kind of looked at and said, you know, after the Chelsea victory, I thought, you know what, we can win probably the next four in a row. Beat Brighton, West Brom, Newcastle and Palace. We've obviously drawn with Palace um, and we've got Newcastle coming up. So... No, we're going to win games. We'll win a few games here and there. But if you're talking about a consistent run of victories, you know, six, seven wins, which we probably need to get back up the table if we're going to do anything, then no, I, I don't think we will. I don't think I don't think we're reliable. You know, Kieran Tierney came out of the team and, you know, there were so many interviews last night where people were saying, Kieran Tierney, you know, we look so weak without Tierney. And I thought, how many teams do you look at? big teams around Europe where a left-back's out of the team and we're that hurt by him being out in attack. You can understand if, like, he got, you know, we brought in a, a left-back who got ripped apart. We're actually talking about a left-back in the attacking sense, how much we missed him. That just shows you how weak we are going forward. So, now, for me, you know, if we we need to win, like, six or seven games in a row to get back into any sort of decent position. And we've just had a nice run of fixtures. You know, we, we drop points against Palace. There's no guarantees we beat Newcastle. And um, so, no, look, I, I think, I think like Turkish said earlier, I think this season's a write-off in the Premier League. And I think the manager needs to look at how he manages the cup competition because, you know, I think uh, when Mourinho was at Man United, he kind of saw the Premier League season faltering away and put all his eggs in the Europa League and won it. And that gave them the catalyst to build on. So I think... Arteta's got a, he's got to use them cup competitions more. I think the Prem is, the Prem is, you know, whether we finish 10th, 8th, 7th, it's all the same failure to me, if I'm being honest. So judging by what you're saying there, you would agree with Turkey that we should prioritise the Europa League as a yeah. to win. Yeah, so definitely. To in terms of targets then, that would be, the Europa League would be your main target. Yeah, yeah. It you, has to. you think that's attainable? I mean... Obviously, we don't know who's dropping out of the Champions League yet, but um, yeah, we do, we do, we know. Yeah, yeah, we've seen them. I mean, it's it's a harder competition than it was last season, but you know, we saw with the FA Cup last year, you wouldn't have expected us to win that with Chelsea and Man City. So you get a little bit of luck of the draw. You beat Benfica, maybe you get a good 
a good draw in the next round. It, it's winnable. It's winnable, but you know we'll, we'll have to see what happens. Benfica is not easy, but if we perform, we can beat them over two legs. Mm. Although we did go out to Olympiacos last week. So. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, anything's possible. <laughs> yeah, anything's possible. You know, Turkish. What? So, yeah. How do you think the Europa League plays out then? I mean, you know, there are going to be some strong sides in that competition. Do you think um, the squad, with the way it is at the moment, we can make a reasonable run in that competition? Do you think it's feasible that we could win it? I mean, we came close a couple, you know, when I say it came close, I mean we got to the final. We were, yeah, quite comfortably beaten on the night by Chelsea. But that's another story. But this set of players, this squad, this manager, do you think that the current squad can do anything in this competition? We can, because like Curtis said, it's a cup competition. And who would have expected us to beat Chelsea and City on the route to the FA Cup last year? And Chelsea and City, um, in terms of, well, maybe not Chelsea last season, but City, you're not going to face much better teams than City in the Europa League. So it, it, it'll come down to the day and the mentality and, and you know, and with our players' confidence and form, it, it all comes into play because it seems like, you know, when they're on a high, things work out a bit better. But it... If some things happen over the weeks before the game, you know, then it will say a lot for their their heads going in. So I think as much as we want to prioritise the Europa League, if we have a bad run in the Premier League, that's going to have a knock-on effect. And mm. what I wanted to ask you two is, because I was just thinking about it now, don't you, when you look at Man City or when you look at Liverpool, you see very serious group of players. Yeah, you see young players in there, happy players, good vibes, but very serious. And you look at Man United, you look at Arsenal, and it's a bit childish, you know? Yeah. It's a bit childish in there. And, and, and I think that is a core reason why, you know, the mentality and character doesn't get us over the line in terms of challenging, because, you know... So are you questioning the mentality of the players? When you say childish, yeah. you're talking about the mindset. Yeah, right. Man City, Liverpool, okay, that might be extreme examples. But even if I look at Wolves, for example, I don't see many clowns or jokers in the Wolves side. But I see many clowns or jokers in the Arsenal and United side. I don't see many clowns or jokers in the Leicester side or the Southampton side. I see very serious players there. How many no, serious players? We are players? above Wolves currently in the table. Um, yeah, yeah, we are. But I mean, in terms of the last few years, Nuno yeah. and what, what Wolves have done, um, I think that you've got to give him credit. And I think... It comes down to our players, you know, do they want it or not? Because mm. the manager can only do so much and it falls onto the players now. We can't sign players after January the 31st. So if they want it, at least try your hardest, try your best. Last year mm. against Olympiacos was poor. If you go out with a performance like that, then you're going to get criticised, rightly so. But if you leave it all on the line and you go out there, we know you're not good enough anyway. But if you leave it all on the line... That's the bare minimum you should be doing playing for Arsenal. Yes, very interesting point you raised there um, in terms of, I mean, myself and Curtis have spoken several times on this show about mentality and mindset and mental toughness and all the rest of it. And I'm actually one of those who believe that we have sufficiently good players at the club that we should be doing better than we are. I personally believe that, listen, we're no world leaders. We know that, yeah? But I think... 11th at the moment in this league is underachieving. That, I honestly think that. I think that we do have some very good players. Um, mm -hmm. okay, the confidence is not great at the moment. There's lots of form, you know, your Aubameyangs and people like that. Pepe's not really shown what we know he's capable of or what we think he's capable of. Um, and there are one or two others in that boat. Um, but I think that the manager should be getting a bit more out of the players. Do you not think that, Turkish? Well, what were we? We're eleventh now, and at the beginning of the season, when they asked, when people asked me where would we finish, I said fifth to twelfth. Okay, well, we're roughly in that. We're roughly in that zone. Um, so I can't, I can't over criticize. Should he be doing better? I can't even say that for sure because I've lost hope in all of these, in a lot of these players. There's thirty-two players on our books, including the people on loan. When I go through them, I'd only keep eleven. Eleven of thirty-two players. That means twenty-one players are either not good enough, they're tried, tested or failed, or their contracts are coming to an end. So I really can't start judging any manager accurately until the manager is given enough. Listen, the problems at this club right now, they're in Edu's hands and in this Richard Garlic's hands. I don't see it as in Arteta's hands. Arteta's the manager. 
Edu and Richard Garlic, they're the ones behind the scenes now that should be doing business right now. I don't care if he just walked through the door. I don't care if he's coming next month. Edu's had the plan for a while. Arteta, I can judge him and I can be critical, but it wouldn't be fair because he hasn't been given a fair chance either. So am I happy with Arteta? Not so much, but has he been given a fair chance? No. So I don't know. I don't know how to play it. You know, it's a bit difficult. It wouldn't be fair for me to completely, you know, judge Arteta on what we've seen this season. But it would be ignorant of me not to say that there are some concerns there, that he is becoming part of the problem. Mm. It's still very much in the air to, to see. Yeah, for well, sure. Good, great, good, good response. Um, Curtis, same question to you then. Do you think that the manager should be getting more out of these players and can he get more out of these players? I mean, yeah, I think he should. I, I think um, I don't think 11th is, is where we should be. And Turkish makes a great point there about, you know, the seriousness on the pitch, uh, especially when you look at Man City and Liverpool. And to me, I think that comes from the managers. You know, you, so you look at Pep and, and Klopp, two great tacticians, but very serious. They're there to win. You know, you know when them guys step through the door, they're not there to try and, you know, just have a jolly up or figure things out. They're there to win. You mentioned Man United and Arsenal where there are a few people there who are not too serious. And again, I think that comes from the managers. And I think this is what I go back to. I think Arsenal needed to bring in a winner as a manager to try and eradicate that soft, weak mentality in the dressing room that you can just mess about. I always said, you know, Arsenal are like a group of naughty school kids playing up the supply teacher. You know, you need... They needed a proper leader in there. You know, you look at Carlo Ancelotti at Everton, a proper manager. You know, he's building something there. I'm not saying they're going to go on and achieve great things, but you know he's steering that club in the right direction. I just genuinely look at Arteta and I see a manager that is figuring out the job. And that's not his fault. We knew this was going to happen. But the question is, how long will it take him to figure out the job? Will he ever reach the level? that we are required to reach and and do the board take him serious enough you know are they looking at him going listen man just tell him to get on with it he's lucky to have the job anyway you know we're not spending money if you had a big manager there right now who's won champions leagues won titles and he's going to the board they're going to be there's going to be friction in the boardroom which is probably a reason they never appointed a Mourinho and Allegri and Ancelotti because they didn't want that kind of friction so to me Listen, I, I'm not convinced by the manager. I'm not, um, but I can't blame him fully. I, I don't think he was prepared to take the job. There's too many other things going on around the scenes for him to just coach and, and improve players. So, yeah, for me, I, I just think, um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's not going well. It's not going well. But like you said, you know, Edu needed to step up this month and, and give him a couple of players for him to improve. And he's given him nothing so far. So, all that boom messy talk. He ain't really backing that up right now, is he? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. And of course, like, uh, so you guys are saying pretty much that we should prioritise Europa League. And um, I did make a Freudian slip, actually, when I was talking about the Champions League teams coming in. What I meant to say was that with the Champions, the teams that dropped out of the Champions League, we don't know who we're going to get going forward. Yeah, so yeah. It could that could ultimately decide how far we go in the tournament. Because if we get one of the better teams that's dropped out, it yeah. could be argued that on paper they would be favoured to go through against us. So, um, yeah. yeah, I'm looking at it now. We've got, we've got AC Milan in there, top of the league in Italy. We've got Rome, Roma in there, Leicester are in there, Tottenham United are in there, Lille, Real Sociedad with David Silva's in there. You've got Rangers in there who are on a high, Napoli, Benfica, Salzburg. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, there's, uh, there's some very capable teams in Villarreal. Give us Unai Emery and Villarreal. Oh, no. Give us Unai Emery and Villarreal. Can you imagine? Wow. wow. Can you imagine? Wow. Yeah. Right, okay. um, so that's the Europa League then. FA Cup, um, we're the holders. Would another FA Cup win satisfy you this season? Turkish, what are you playing, bro? Trophies are always satisfying. But it's it's not it's not enough. It's, it's FA Cup has never been enough, and it and it won't be enough. But I'll be I'm always satisfied by trophies because I look at it like this, Laurie. As much as listen, last year there's three teams in England that won a trophy: Liverpool Premier League, Man City League Cup, Arsenal FA Cup. 
Yeah, so for all the banter and all the laughs and vibes that Chelsea, United and Tottenham fans got from 2020, we got a trophy. We got something in our history books. Top four doesn't give you anything but entry. Banter doesn't give you anything but a quick laugh, you know. So trophies are the be-all and end-all, but, but we've won three in the past six years and it's done nothing for us in terms of progression. Yeah. So, yes, I'd love the FA Cup again. It's our cup. I'd love it. And it adds to your history and it adds to your, your, your brand. Well, but, we're the record holders of that competition. Yeah, yeah. But I wouldn't be satisfied by it alone, no. Definitely not. And even if it got you into the Europa League for the following year, you still wouldn't be happy with it? Ah, Laurie, Europa, if, if we don't get into Champions League next season, then we need to drop Europa League out. Would you rather drop out of it, yeah? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Mm. You see, the trouble with dropping out of it, and unless you qualify in the Champions League spaces in the top four, then you've got no chance of Champions League football. Yeah, well, I, I want a season where maybe it's just Premier League. If we can't get back into Champions League and do it properly, then I just want Premier League. This Thursday, Sunday, Thursday, Monday, all oh, this malarkey is not, not... I'm not on it. I'm not on it. It's not the most glamorous. No. Curtis, uh, question to you then. The same question I asked Turkish. We're current holders of the FA Cup, although we do have a pretty difficult draw um, because the draw was too pronged, so... We've got either Southampton or Shrewsbury. And like I said before, it looks like it's going to be Southampton. No disrespects to Shrewsbury. And if we do get through that game, which is going to be a difficult game, um, then I think who we got in the front? Wolves. And again, yeah. it's going to be difficult. Uh, so would you take the FA Cup? Would you be satisfied with that as an achievement this season? I mean, look, I'll just echo what Turkish said, really. It's, listen, we all love winning trophies. It's, it's great on the day you win the FA Cup. As you said, there's only three trophies that we can win, but it's nowhere near enough, man. It's, it's nowhere near. It's only a good achievement to me if you build on it. You know, we should have built on it last summer. Yeah, we've won a trophy. Aubameyang signed a new deal. Go and hammer the transfer market. That's what I wanted to see happen, but they sat on their hands again. So winning the FA Cup would just be like, well, yeah, great, but we're in the same position we were in a year ago. So, no, so it's not. Regard the, if we did win the FA Cup, and it's a big if, because like I said, man, it's going to be a difficult competition to win, as they all are. Um, if we did end up winning the FA Cup, retaining the trophy, would you see that as a successful season? No. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess uh, you feel the same way, Turkish, yeah? Yeah, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be. Because, listen, you need to build on what you've done the year before. So if you win the FA Cup one year and finish um, eighth, then I expect you, if you're winning the FA Cup next year, to finish top four and FA Cup. Not not just the same season you've had the season before. You're telling us transition. You're telling us be patient and all of this shit. Well, show us progression. Show us, you know, a, a stepping ladder up until success. That doesn't show it. Two FA Cups in a row, great trophies, but it doesn't show progression. Yeah. Okay, point taken. Some very forthright opinions advanced there. Right, so let's bring it round then. So we got the three competitions we spoke of, and the question was, um, what are our realistic attainments, targets, if you like? So if we go through Premier League, Curtis, what would you take as your minimum requirement target for this season? What was um, I mean, I, I wouldn't, it's one of them, innit? I want a top four, so, and that's not going to happen. Anything out of that is <laughs> failure, innit? I don't, I don't know, like. So it's top four or nothing for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I listen, maybe if we get top six is something, but I can't, I don't even think we'll get top six. So anything outside of that to me is just ridiculous. What do you think we'll get? I mean, maybe. we're halfway through the season. I'm not even sure we get eighth. I think maybe ninth, tenth. No, ninth, ninth, tenth. Yeah. Uh, Turkish, what are you saying? Premier League? Yeah. I think what you just said is bang on. Top four or nothing. I can't say fifth will make me happy, content, sick. No. Nah. Top four or nothing. Right, okay. <laughs> and then we've got the Europa League, which all the guys agreed should be our main priority for this season. Yeah. Curtis, Europa League, realistically, do you think that we can do something in that competition, you know, get to the last stages, get to the final, win it. What, what do you think? I think we can, but it'll be difficult. Um, but but maybe the cup competitions will suit Arteta more, you know, having seen the FA Cup run. I know he failed ultimately in the Europa League, but 
that's his last saving grace for me. This, if he wins that Europa League, I'll put both hands up and say you've you've pulled it out of the bag. Still, you know what I mean. So we can win it, but will we win it? Is is a different question. And same question to you, my friend. Turkish. Yeah, you can't. You can't tell, Laurie. You can't. I mean, look, we, we've we've beaten Napoli, we've beaten Valencia, we've lost to Olympiacos in the, in the Europa League. So we can. Um, and looking at the teams I just mentioned, as off-putting as a lot of them are, they're all winnable too on our day, you mm. know. But we just don't have many days. So I think we can do it, but it's the luck of the draw for us. We have to have luck on our side. Right. Okay. So I wouldn't say you're overly optimistic there. Then. So okay. No. So those are the three major trophies. You're saying the FA Cup were pretty much um, not disregarding it, but you know, we we want to see something else other than the FA Cup. Uh, the Europa League is going to be the main priority, you said, um, but you're not wholly confident of winning that, although you think we are capable of putting together a good run. And then, of course, the Premier League, um, you pretty much agreed that um, the top four is not going to happen. Even top six is unrealistic. And you're looking at a ninth or tenth place, which would be, if we did finish ninth or tenth, uh, a position or two below what we finished last season. So, Ultimately, based on the discussion, <laughs> I have to say that the outlook is quite bleak, really, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. it, it is. Um, and that's where we find ourselves at midway point of the season. Um, but Again. You know, football is a funny game. As I said before, you've seen what Man United have done recently. They've put together a run of good results um, at a time when, when they first started the run, there was talk that the manager might be sacked. And he's gone on this good run and he's seemingly turned things around. So you never know. And, and listen, um, we're in the middle of COVID. The COVID pandemic has wreaked havoc with football, as it's done with a lot of other things in life. And even the, uh, the dynamic of home and away fixtures has totally changed now. So it's making it a lot harder predict, to predict game. So, for example, our game against Crystal Palace was a home game. But really and truly, that was neutralised because there's no fans in the stadium. Um, and the conditions and the dynamics are such that home games this season don't really operate the way home games would have done seasons in bygone eras. So there's still a lot to play for, man. Um, I don't want to be <laughs> end the show on a uh, totally negative. Um, play Arsenal. Play Arsenal, Laurie, because that, they're the reason you have to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, man, we're all hoping that uh, the manager and the players can turn things around. Um, I'm sure they're all trying as hard as they can. It's just if we can get the get the performances improved and raise the levels of confidence and see how we go from here. OK, thanks very much for that, guys. I just want to... Sorry, just, just a quick one. No, no, I'm going to I'm gonna come back to you. I'm just saying that we finished that segment of the show. Oh, OK, OK. One of our regular features is the Ops of the Week, where we look at... Arsenal's next game, which of course, as we alluded to earlier, is the Newcastle game. Um, and I was going to ask you for your quick predictions on that game. We'll start with you, Turkey. We've got I Newcastle coming up in the league. We've beaten them in the cup, although some would say rather fortuitously beat them in extra time. But yeah. we've got them in the cup. Um, Newcastle has to be said, they're not in a great run of form. Um, and they tend to set up quite, say negatively, but they're not going to go for it, let's be yeah. honest. Rigid. Um, um, yeah. um, just, game. What do you they, think? They just lost to Sheffield United as well. The Sheffield United's first win of the season. So they're, right. coming off, they're coming off the back of an FA Cup exit. Sheffield United loss. So really and truly, we should be able to to handle them. I, I expect to start Emil Smith, Rose, Saka. I think Tierney. I just read some good news on Tierney, so he might be back in that game. Martinelli apparently he's back. So I think we've got enough in our locker to to dispose of them, but it, it will be tight, maybe a 2-1, 2, -one, two -nil. Yeah, OK. Uh, Curtis, opposite mm. of Newcastle. Uh, yeah, I'll go 2 nil. I'll go 2 nil. Gabriel Partey, if Tierney's back, Martinelli back, that puts us pretty much at full strength. Um, so, yeah, I think I think we'll beat them. I think we'll beat them 2-0. Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, you make a very good point there. We've got players on the verge of coming back now. You know what I mean? Um, Tierney hopefully should be back. He's been very influential in recent weeks. Partey, um, we were raving about him before he got injured. He was looking like the real deal. If he comes back, Gabriel um, had a little bit of a dip in form before his suspension. But, 
We're hoping that he can come in and pick up back the pace again. Mm -hmm. um, listen, man, I, I've said it all along, man. There's some good players in that team. And I think that we're 11th at the moment, and I think we're underachieving. We do have some very good players there. Abamyang, Lacazette, um, Pepe and Willian, all these guys. You know what I mean? They're, they're not performing at anywhere near the levels that, well, Lacazette is. But, you know, the other guys have not really shown this season for whatever reason. And if they start to pick up form and show a bit of confidence, man, I'm confident that we can get some results in there. How far we can go with it is anyone's guess. But we should be doing more, better than what we're doing right now. You know? um, so that's how I feel, man. What do the viewers feel? What do the people watching the show feel? Let us know, man. Write in, message us, contact us. Let us know what you think, you know. But we are coming to the end of the show. And um, thanks very much to both of you guys for coming on. Curtis is always always does his thing, man. It's always nice to have him. Great to have him in the house. Turkish, first time on the show. Fantastic to have you on, bro. Hope you'll come back again. You've made some really good, honest and forthright thoughts there. Um, you were going to say something earlier? Now it's just yeah. Nice. So, last, so last year, um, I, I injured my wrist and I got the camera crew in. to, to, to they, they covered my, you know, my rehab and everything. So I'm going to come out of a documentary soon to show my rehab and show how my wrist was healing and all that. Yeah. It's my competition for Bellerin out there, you know. That's the market now. So I'm thinking, yeah, look out for that. Look out for that because my wrist was proper. Is, it, is, that, is that the same Bellerin that seemed to have an issue with social media before, isn't it? Oh, it was, it's, it's, it's that same individual, man. Yeah, yeah, that same individual. That same clout-chasing individual. Yeah, really? yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, no sooner at the game finished, he was out there giving interviews. I thought uh, Bamiang was a captain and I thought he was a manager. It seems that Bellerin always manages to... Get he him wants to front yeah. of that camera. Uh, he's very good at that. He's actually better than that than he is at throw-ins. Yeah, I mean? you need to get Robbie to call him, get him behind the camera instead because he's not he's yeah. not any use on the fucking pitch. Yeah. <laughs> he's, only, he's only got a problem with social media when other people are doing it. When he's doing it, he appears to be fine with it. You know, yeah, what I mean? no problem, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, man, listen, thanks very much for coming on, bro. Really appreciate. It. Tell the people where they can find you about your channels and stuff like that. Um, Turkish LDN on all platforms, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, Turkish LDN. Yeah, man, make sure you check out that content, man. Turkish has always been one of my favorite AFTV influencers. Oh, um, chop it up at games, man, long before you come on this channel. So keep yeah. up with your work, bro. Come um, on, Lordy. Uh, I hope to have you back on again very soon. My boy Curtis, tell the people where they can find you and what's been going on, bro. Yeah, check out the channel, man. Curtis Shaw TV, daily content, man. You know, just come through, man. Big yeah, up to for coming through, man. No worries. Come on, man. Anytime. Thanks, guys, for coming on the show. Thanks to all of you, man, out there for supporting the show. Like, share, subscribe to the channel. Keep supporting us. We really appreciate it. Keep the show interactive, and we'll see you next week. It's Robbie here from AFTV. Don't forget to check out AFTV on Flick for all the latest transfer rumours, for all the information on Arsenal, for all the information on AFTV. You can check me there for Q&As on a regular basis. The link is in the description. It is free to download. Download it right now.